But first of all, how, how is everyone? Huh? Are you sure? Huh? Yeah? <laughs> this is what this question is about, right? This is what we, this Dhamma talk is going to be about today, the question or the answer to the question of how are you? Huh? And uh, I have been uh, torturing some of the people uh, at, um, thank you so much, that's very kind of you. <laughs> I've been torturing some of the people at the BSWA. Yeah, the BSWA is the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. And they have been coming to the monastery. And when they come to the monastery, like now, often there's a large crowd of people coming. And I often ask them, how are you? And then everyone says, good. Yeah. And I say, are you sure? <laughs> what do you mean by good? What is it compared to what exactly? You know, what are you? Are you the Buddha yet? Are you an Arahant? Are you good compared to yesterday, compared to last year, compared to Ajahn Brahm? Exactly what do you mean by good anyway? So what is, the, what is this? And after a while, I kept on asking, how are you? After a while, they stopped replying because they knew I was up to some kind of dodgy business. <laughs> This is what happens when you have, when these things go on. So that was a, so a bit, bit of fun, but actually it is very, uh, it is interesting question, right? Uh, how are you? What does it actually mean? Uh, on the one hand, you can say that how are you is just like a social thing that we do, and everyone says good, and it means nothing. Uh, it means zero. It means good. It means, okay, I'm here. I'm, you know, all right. I'm having a cup of coffee or, or whatever, and you're fine. Uh, it doesn't mean very much. Uh, but uh, if you actually look at that question, it also has real meaning. Yeah? What does it mean more from a Buddhist point of view? Uh, what is kind of the philosophical, if you like, implications uh, of the answer or even that question? Uh, and uh, when we look at it in that way, we can draw out some deeper meaning of what this question actually is. Uh, and especially when you ask people, I remember sometimes in a monastery, I would ask some of my fellow monks, there was one monk in particular, every time I asked him, how are you, he'd always say, fantastic. <laughs> and I thought, no way, you are fantastic every day. <laughs> there's, no, there's, there's no one is fantastic every day. Yeah. And sure enough, soon enough, he disrobed, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, this, so it is also good to be realistic about these things. What is actually going on? How, how are we really in a deep way? Are things going the way they should be going? And these are some of the issues I want to talk about today. And um, for myself, when I uh, investigate these kind of questions, uh, one of the things I like to ask is, well, what would the Buddha say? If you ask the Buddha, how are you? What would the Buddha say? Yeah, because that's kind of a starting point to get a kind of handle on the Dhamma. I always ask, what was someone who was very, very wise? What would they say? Yeah, what would Ajahn Brahm say? Actually, that's a, you're not sure what Ajahn Brahm would say. He says random things. It's impossible to know what Ajahn Brahm would say. So let's just stay with something more theoretical like the Buddha, <laughs> <laughs> less tangible. And uh, so, what would the Buddha say? Uh, yeah? And uh, to be able to understand what the Buddha was, would say, uh, we need to understand the Buddha, first of all. Uh. And so, I want to talk a little bit about the Buddha, the way we approach, the way we see the Buddha in the suttas, uh, the various aspects of what it means to be a Buddha. Uh, very often, uh, you probably do it here as well, we do the chant, Itipiso Bhagava Adahang, yeah? that is the qualities of the Buddha. And uh, this is what the Buddha himself lays down. These are the qualities you should reflect on uh, when you think about the Buddha. This is what it says. Uh, so whenever you see that formula, think about it. Uh, what does it actually mean? Uh, and once you start thinking about these formulas and you bring out the deeper meaning of these things, uh, that is when you create a relationship uh, with the Buddha. And as Buddhists, it is appropriate to have a relationship with the Buddha. Yeah, to take the Buddha as our teacher, but to be able to do that, we have, have to have some kind of feeling for the Buddha. Who was he? What kind of, what kind of person or being was the Buddha? How can we relate to him in a teacher in a good way? This is what this really is about. And so to start out with this, I'm going to talk about, first of all, some of the qualities of the Buddha as an arahant, yeah? what it means to be fully awakened, uh, what it means to have a you know, profound understanding of this world. Uh, what are these qualities? Yeah? Where does that come from? Uh, and uh, the first thing that uh, kind of comes to mind, if you want to start out with the Buddha even before his awakening, when he started out, uh, yeah? one of the kind of extraordinary things to me about the Buddha was how he took the ordinary realities of human life uh, and made something extraordinary out of it. 
you may know before the Buddha's awakening, he, he was reflecting on the problems of life, yeah? Old age, death and suffering, according to the uh, traditional story, which I think is not quite right, but anyway, traditional story, he saw the dead person, the sick person, and the, and the uh, old person, yeah? And then he saw the samana, the ascetic, and he decided to become a monk. Yeah? Actually, I think the reality is that he reflected on these things. Uh, but this is like a uh, kind of later expansion on the earliest ideas of what happened. Uh, when you read the, uh, the suttas, this is what seemed to happen. The Buddha was reflecting on these things. Uh, but the extraordinary thing about the Buddha, yeah, he reflects on illness, uh, old age and death. Uh, and what does he do? Does he kind of say, yeah, yeah, whatever, it happens later in life, I don't have to worry about those things? Uh, no. What the Buddha does, he takes these things so seriously. Uh, he understands that these things are really profoundly problematic. Uh, these things have to do with a larger idea of what life really is about. He already had an idea, it seems, of rebirth, because that was probably, to some extent at least, part of the Indian culture. And he could see that if, if this carries on in the future as well, it's kind of really concerning, yeah? It is not just death, it is re-death. Have you ever considered that? Yeah, it should, be, it should really be translated re-death rather than just death. It should be translated re-old age re-sickness and of course rebirth because these things come together and that is where these things become really powerful and this is what the buddha to be before his awakening what he actually saw and what does he do he decides to become a monk he decides to walk off into the forest to find a solution to these problems of life and that is what is so amazing about the buddha how many of you when you think about death, just walk off into the jungle in Malaysia, say, I'm going to find a solution to death, right? No one does that. It takes someone with kind of really powerful spiritual qualities to have that audacity, yeah, that ability to think like that. I'm going to find a solution to the profoundest realities of human life. And that gives you an idea of what kind of person the Buddha is. The Buddha is someone who has this uh, extraordinary ability to take the challenges in life, uh, take them on, and then do something with it. Uh. And then, of course, the Buddha then goes out and he trains under the existing teachers that were available at that time, Alara Kalama, Uddha Buddha, and also other teachers as well. Uh. And then he decides, no, this is not good enough. Yeah, this just leads to the rebirth in a very nice realm or whatever, but actually doesn't really take me where I want to go, which is an ending of all of these problems. Yeah? And then he kind of branches out on his own, sets out on his own, says, thank you very much to everything else in Indian society, I'm going to go my own way. Yeah? And of course, when he then goes his own way, yeah, he actually does find a solution. Yeah? And this is the other thing about the Buddha that I find so interesting and inspiring. He's one of these geniuses in the world who dares to go against all of what everyone else is saying. All the rest of society in India at that time, they said, you should search for God, for Brahman. You should search for the universal consciousness, or whatever it is. You should do ascetic practices, or whatever it might be. Or you should just live an ordinary household life. But he goes against all of that. He rejects everything around him. He's one person against the whole world. Yeah, one person against the whole world. This is like the act of a hero. If you uh, think about the great people in humanity, they're often that kind of people. They're the people who dare to set out on their own, dare to do things differently, think differently from everyone else, and then reject everything that doesn't really work because they follow their heart, they follow the truth as far as possible. So this is kind of the, some of the ideas of the Buddha. And what is the result of having those kind of spiritual qualities? Well, the result, of course, was that the Buddha actually did find that awakening here. Yeah, one day sitting under the Bodhi tree after doing all of these kind of things, setting out on his own, his last friends, the five friends that he had, they also abandoned him. Now he's completely by himself. No one in the whole world agrees with him. Yeah, he's kind of standing on his own. That is where he finds awakening. And that is the mastery of someone who is eventually the greatest spiritual genius in human history. That is what the Buddha is. 
the greatest spiritual genius in human history, as far as I'm concerned. I'm just a slightly biased, obviously. <laughs> I, you know, when you wear these robes, you don't become entirely neutral. But uh, that is what I say. Yeah, he is. Uh, and uh, what exactly did he discover? Uh, what is it that the Buddha saw? Yes, we talk about awakening, and awakening means that you're kind of coming out of a delusion, coming out of a dream state, if you like. Uh, but what exactly is it that he found? Uh, and I think if we start to understand what the Buddha found, we start also to appreciate much more who the Buddha is as a teacher. And the one thing that he found more than anything else, he found the answer to the question of the meaning of life. Yeah, he discovered the answer to the meaning of life. And that, again, is, if you think about it, really, really extraordinary. Because the search for the meaning of life has been the preoccupation of philosophers, of religious seekers, of spiritual uh, seekers from time immemorial. If you go back, I think, in all human cultures throughout history, this has been one of the core kind of things that we have been looking for. And has anyone really found it? I think the answer is no. I think the first person who, the first person who found this was actually the Buddha. How? Does that manifest? How can I say that the Buddha discovered the very meaning of life? What do I even mean by that? And uh, what I mean by that is that he found something uh, that was so satisfying, uh, so led to such degree of contentment and happiness uh, that all craving was gone. He didn't have any craving anymore. Yeah, This is kind of the definition in the suttas of the idea of awakening, no more craving. Uh, what does it mean when you have no more craving? It means that there is nothing more to be done. There is nothing to move you to do anything anymore. There's nowhere, there's nowhere else to go, right? In other words, you have found the final end point of seeking. That's why there is no more craving. If there still was craving, it means that there would be more to be done. But the fact that there is no more craving means you have found the answer to the search, the answer to the purpose, the answer to the meaning of life itself. That is why there is no more craving when you become an arahant. Why? There's no, nowhere else to go. If you haven't found the meaning, craving will still be there because there's more to be done, more places to move on to. So the Buddha discovered the meaning of life. Yeah? This is what he discovered. Yeah? And once you have discovered the answer to the meaning of life, once you have understood the profoundest truth of what it means to be a human being, once you have understood that, then of course you want to teach that to the world. And because the Buddha has found something that is universal, a universal truth of humanity, he doesn't just teach the Indians that are there in his audience, yeah, like you are here in the audience today. You can imagine around the Buddha there will often be a large audience of people, yeah, a large group of Indians from all walks of life. Uh, but he didn't just teach the people who were around him. Uh, because when the Buddha set out, because he knew that he had discovered the truth that is true for all humanity, he wanted to leave this as a legacy. Uh, he wanted to leave this as a gift to all of humanity, yeah, to people here in Malaysia, yeah, BGF, right? Uh, you are part of the recipients of the word of the Buddha. People in Australia, yeah, it's slowly awakening also to the message of the Buddha. It's taking a bit of time, but it's kind of coming around to it even down there. <laughs> and, yeah, so when the Buddha set out teaching, he had this idea of setting in motion the Dhamma Chakka, the wheel of the Dhamma. And the wheel of the Dhamma is this uh, fit this um, image uh, of something rolling out in the world and rolling on from generation to generation, from society to society, with a certain momentum to it. Because when you set something rolling, it has a certain momentum, yeah, when you set the wheel going. Yeah. And so he set this going, knowing that he had a message for all of humanity. Yeah. And let's be very clear about this, that this is actually very unique in the history of the world, in the history of world religions, in the history of world philosophy, that someone sets out with an, with an idea that this is for everyone. Yeah, usually, if you look at the history of religion, usually religion is about, you know, okay, this is my God and these are my people. It's like a deal between a certain people and their God. It relates to a particular place. It is slightly parochial, yeah? Whereas Buddhism, instead of being parochial, from the very 
a get-go at the very beginning. It was a universal religion that is true for everyone. It has a universal outlook, a universal appeal. And this is really quite unique about the Buddhist teachings. And so when we think about Buddhism, we shouldn't undersell it. We should understand that we are in, actually in the presence of something really precious, really unique in the world. And the more you start to understand that, the more you start to understand that these things are actually, uh, they are different from what you normally hear or from what you can get hold of anywhere else. It is actually very powerful. So it is universal, yeah? The other thing which is very interesting about this teaching the Buddha discovered, which is so powerful, is that it is also a naturalistic uh, teaching. Uh, yeah, it is about the workings of nature. Uh, in Buddhism, there's nothing that kind of stands outside of nature. Uh, there's nothing which stands outside and then starts nature, so to speak, uh, gets nature going. Uh, that is not how Buddhists work. Uh, everything is about understanding how nature itself actually is. Uh, so when you think about things like rebirth or the laws of karma or even awakening itself, all of that is part of the natural world of nature in the larger kind of sense of things. And again, this is also very unique in the history of the world and world religions. All we are seeking to do is to understand the world. Yeah? That is what this really is about. So in that sense, it is kind of parallel to science. Yeah? It is, an, it is not science, but it's parallel to science. It's a similar kind of inquiry about understanding the nature of existence. So again, very, something very kind of unique. And so this is to me some of those things that I think we don't often contemplate enough. Yeah? The idea that these Buddhist teachings, what the Buddha discovered, actually is very different. It is not really something that you find very easy anywhere else. Yeah, and we should remember this because when we remember the real qualities of Buddhism, we become more committed to these teachings because we understand that we are in the presence of something really extraordinary, something really special. Yeah, uh, nature itself, understanding the way the world actually operates, finding the answer to the meaning of life. This is what the Buddha discovered. This is who the Buddha was, and this is what makes the Buddha really special. These are the insights that his awakening were about. So um, this is uh, the Buddha for you, right? This extraordinary person, the person who was an arahant, who had an insight into the nature of existence. Uh, and when you see him in the suttas, of course, because he had this kind of insight, uh, he was also very fearless. Yeah, he knew what he knew. Uh, and uh, sometimes you see the Buddha in arguments or in discussions with people. And of course, he is a master uh, discusser, yeah, you have the like the discussion with the uh, Satchaka in the Mahasatchaka Sutta, no, in the uh, yeah, Mahasatchaka Sutta in particular, uh, where he discusses, yeah, and he kind of uh, it's kind of interesting to see how, how the Buddha discusses with people. Uh, he doesn't really argue with anyone, but if people come to argue with him, okay, then he kind of engages, yeah, when they come, uh, and he's always very powerful in his arguments. Uh. And then, uh, of course, the Buddha because he had an understanding of the nature of the whole universe. The universe, according to Buddhism, also includes the gods. So it was also a teacher of the gods. And so you have beautiful suttas like the Sakapanya Sutta, where Sakka, who is the lord of the gods, he comes down to the Buddha and he asks questions of the Buddha. Yeah, you know the Sakapanya Sutta? It's a beautiful sutta found in the long discourse, the Diganeka number 21. And it's very charming kind of a discourse because Sakka, yeah, Sakka is this incredibly powerful deity, uh, one of the most powerful beings uh, uh, thinkable in the universe. Uh, but when it comes to the Buddha, he's a bit shy. Yeah, Sakka is shy. Yeah, it's like, what, what's going on? How is that possible? Sakka, this very, very powerful being. If you saw Sakka, you probably would bow down straight away and think, wow, this is true. I'm converting to Christianity now because Christianity was right. Uh, that's probably what will happen if you saw Sakka because, wow, oh, yeah, something going on. So be careful not to be fooled by external appearances. That's actually very important. Uh, so Sakka is this very, very powerful deity, but in in the presence of the Buddha, feeling a bit shy. So he sends this uh, Gandhava. Gandhava is a heavenly musician. Okay, so Gandhava goes down and kind of uh, sings, it has a lute, yeah, plays the lute, and then sing, chants this song or sings this song to the Buddha. Yeah? And then when the Buddha has kind of got, a track, got the attention of the Buddha, then the Buddha then 
the Gandhava Panchaseka says, okay, well, uh, you know, Venerable Sir, the Sakka would like to see, okay, please allow Sakka to come. And then Sakka comes and asks these questions. Uh, actually, that's actually also quite interesting that, uh, you know, what kind of song the Gandhava <laughs> sang to the Buddha, what do you think? Yeah, he probably sang about the beauty of the Dhamma, right? The Dhamma's qualities and the qualities of the Arahants. But no, because this is a heavenly musician. They indulge in sensual pleasures. So he sang a love song to the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite extraordinary, isn't it? It's actually true. It's right there in the suttas. It's really, I don't understand how it made it into the suttas, but it is there. So maybe it's true. Yeah, how otherwise would it make it into the suttas? I don't know. But anyway, so, so this strange kind of lead up, and then Sakka comes to the Buddha, the Buddha he has these questions about the nature of, actually a very interesting question that he asks. So, yeah, I should really mention this because it's a really nice question there. And the question Sakka asks the Buddha is, why is it uh, that gods, humans, all kind of beings, why is it that we all want peace, we all want harmony, we all want to like each other, and still we live in war, in hostility, with problems? And that's a really good question, because it's true, right? If you look deep down, all of us, we don't want wars in Ukraine, we don't want the Middle East to blow up, we don't want these things because they are causing so enormous amounts of suffering. And yet somehow we can't seem to stop ourselves. So what is the answer? And then the Buddha gives this beautiful analysis going stage by stage by stage and going back to the very root cause of what that was, or what that is. And do you know what that root cause is? Do you know? We seem a bit, a bit uncertain. <laughs> okay, if you want another cause, Come back next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I kind of get people to kind of come again, right? This is the way I kind of put that little dangler there, this kind of hanging on the cliffs. Next time you have to come back next year, right? So we'll say, if I'm here, we don't know if I'm going to be here, but if I'm here, then next year we'll get the answer to this question. Please write it down, Bobby, so I don't forget about, it, <laughs> about this one. But so, and then anyway, so the the end result of this is that the Buddha teaches Saka, he shows him the whole cause and the structure, why there is violence in the world, yeah? And then uh, at the very end of the sutta, Saka becomes a stream enter, yeah, a sotapanna. He becomes someone who sees the Dhamma. And this is how the Buddha is the kind of the, uh, the teacher of gods and humans. Uh, then there is another place where the Buddha uh, goes to the Brahma Loka, so the, Bra the Brahma is even higher than Saka. And there is this Brahma who says, yeah, I'm the kind of the supreme God. I have created the whole universe. I'm the best. Yeah, I'm, I'm forever after. I will never cease to live or whatever. And the Buddha goes to him to kind of tell him that maybe you've got it wrong. Yeah, maybe you haven't understood the nature of the universe. And so they have this kind of, uh, this, not uh, this kind of uh, almost like hide and seek game. Yeah, who can, who can hide and who can find the other one? It's basically, Brahma says, I will disappear. I will disappear from you, says Brahma, kind of a little bit self-important. Yeah, I will disappear from you, Venerable. And he tries to disappear, can't do it. Yeah. And then the Buddha says, but I will disappear from you. And then he disappears, of course. And then Brahma says, wow, this person more powerful than me. Okay, I better listen. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the idea of the Buddha. And this, you see him in the suttas. You see this kind of extraordinary person in so many ways. And this is, of course, very interesting. Yeah? But... Um, there is another Buddha as well in the suttas, yeah? Um, and uh, maybe before I go on to the other Buddha, I would, maybe I should maybe come back to where I started out, about the question, how are you, yeah? So just very briefly, so the, a Buddha, a person like that, uh, who has full insight into the natural reality, who understands, uh, you know, the human heart all the way to the core, uh, what would that kind of person say if you ask them, how are you? Uh, and that kind of person might give you a very profound teaching, precisely because of the profound insight into the nature of existence. So they may say something that I have found the supreme happiness, maybe. Yeah, Nibbana paramang sukang. Nibbana is the highest happiness. Or maybe they would say something like that was said by the famous nun, the Bhikkhuni Vajira. She said that when she, when she was asked by Mara, you know, how do you how do you conceive of yourself? And she said, and this is similar to asking, how are you? Yeah, she said, suffering arising, suffering passing away. So maybe the Buddha would say, suffering arising, suffering passing away. 
And that's kind of interesting. On the one hand, he is the, has the highest happiness. On the other hand, suffering, arising and suffering, passing away. Yeah. This is kind of the paradox of being an arahant. Uh, this is where you have to understand what that insight actually leads to. Uh, this is kind of the sort of thing you might expect from someone who is fully awake and wow, like have a wow factor in the way they reply to these kind of questions. Uh, so sometimes, uh, given the right circumstances, uh, given someone who is ready for those kind of answers, uh, he might actually give that kind of answer, something really profound and unusual. Uh, but uh, there is another side to the Buddha. And that is the human side of the Buddha. Psychologically, he was an arahant. In his mind, he was kind of gone beyond the ordinary world. But the Buddha still existed in human society. And many of the ways that you see the Buddha in the suttas, his human nature comes out very clearly. Yeah, and this starts out before the Buddha's awakening. I'm going to go back to before the awakening again, when the Buddha was living the home life. And when he was living the home life, you start to see that uh, so many of the ways in which the Buddha looked at the world, the way he experienced the world, the way he dealt with the world, uh, is basically the same kind of problems that we have. Uh, yeah? And you start to recognize that the Buddha actually is a human being. One of the greatest dangers, I think, we sometimes do in Buddhism uh, is that we elevate the Buddha to kind of... Uh, in, what I like to say, we put him on the wrong kind of pedestal. We put him on the pedestal of God or, uh, you know, Dhammakaya or Bodhisattva or something kind of out of reach for ordinary human beings. We put him on a pedestal as something fundamentally different from a human being. And that is, I think, dangerous because if we do that, we actually lose our connection with the Buddha. No longer is he a human being who understands us. He is now something alien, something different, something we can never really understand. But actually, that would be the wrong way. The right pedestal to use for the Buddha is the pedestal of human being perfected. Yeah? Someone who takes the ordinary human nature, just like us, gains a really profound insight into it, and as a consequence, rises above it, becomes an arahant. But we also have that ability to become arahants. And because we also have that ability, there is no fundamental difference between the Buddha and us. And this is very visible when you go back to the Buddha, uh, the, his time before he became the Buddha, when he was the Buddha to be. Uh, yeah, you see some of the biographies of the Buddha. He talks about his own life. Uh, and in places, the Buddha says, well, before my awakening, I too had these defilements of the mind. Yeah, he talks about ill will, he talks about desires, he talks about these things. Maybe his defilements were not very strong, probably not very strong, otherwise he wouldn't have made it, yeah? But they were still there to some extent. Before his awakening, the Buddha talks about being attached. Yeah, he talks about having a wife and a child and having a lot of, he was, you know, he grew up in a well-to-do family. I don't think it was a royalty, but it was, anyway, it was a very well-to-do family. And he was attached to these things. And he says in the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, the Noble Search, Majjhima Nikaya 26, yeah, he specifically says, why am I going after these things? Yeah? This is where his awakening begins. Why am I going after these things? They are just more of the same problem I have already. More death, more old age, more of these kind of things. Because your wife is also going to die. Your husband is going to die. Your kids are going to die. Everyone is subject to these things. Instead of getting more of this, I should find a solution to this. And so he also has attachment to the people and the things around him. Yeah? And, and this also starts to undermine the idea that the Buddha was a bodhisattva for all four incalculable eons, because those ideas are about nekama is one of the paramis you're supposed to, um, you're supposed to practice yeah, for four incalculable eons. But after after doing this for four incalculable years, he's still attached to his family and his belongings. Yeah? What happened to that parami? Is it working or not working? Yeah. Okay, I'm being, being naughty. But this is, a, <laughs> this is how you can kind of see that some of these ideas that we have in Buddhism, in particular the Bodhisattva ideal, is very likely a later development in Buddhism. And there's a very nice book that has been written about that called The Origin, I think, of the uh, Bodhisattva ideal. Uh, where, you can, where it traces the, uh, the kind of root, uh, roots of this whole idea, how it came about. Uh. So the Buddha had defilements. Uh. The Buddha had attachments. Yeah? The Buddha was struggling in his meditation. Uh. Did you know that? Uh? 
It may sound like when you read the very short ideas of the Buddha's biography, he says, oh, I remembered the, uh, as a child I was doing the jhanas, and so I should do the jhanas now. It may sound like it happened very quickly, but if you look at some of the other suttas, like the Upakilesa Sutta, Majjhimanekaya 128, the sutta on the corruptions of the mind, he says, I too, before my awakening, I was seeing lights in the mind, I was seeing forms, and then they disappeared. And then I had to ask myself, why do they disappear? Yeah? And so it seems from that, that the Buddha had a fairly long period where he was struggling with getting his meditation together. So if you are having problems in your meditation, you are in very, very good company indeed. Yeah? <laughs> no wonder you're having problems. The Buddha to be had problems, right? Of course you're having problems. If you didn't have problems, you probably wouldn't uh, be realistic about what's going on. Yeah? So that's kind of the reality. So if you sometimes have some nice meditations and then you struggle to get it back or whatever, welcome to the club. Yeah? <laughs> this is to be expected. Yeah? So it shows you again that the Buddha is sometimes much more human than we think he is. Another place the Buddha says that he had wrong views. Yeah? And the wrong view of the Buddha before his awakening was that he thought that happiness is to be had through pain. This is in the uh, Bodhi Raja Kumara Sutta, the uh, discourse to Prince uh, Bodhi, uh, uh, Majjhimanika number 85. And, uh, and he says quite literally this to Prince Bodhi, before my awakening I too had wrong view. I thought that happiness is to be had through pain and that's why he did all those ascetic practices yeah, that you hear about. Yeah? That's why sometimes we have this statue of uh, not the Buddha, but the Bodhisattva, very thin. Yeah? This is kind of where that idea comes from, because he had wrong view. So that uh, statue of the Buddha-to-be before he was wrong, before he was uh, enlightened, when he's very thin, we should never bow down to it, because you're bowing down to wrong view if you bow down to that one. Yeah? Don't bow down to that one. Bow down to this one. <laughs> this is the right view of Buddha statue. Yeah? We have to distinguish between wrong view and right view. This is the right one over here. So that is kind of the idea. So, of course, you maybe bow down to the Buddha's struggles or whatever. I'm just making a bit of fun of it. But uh, you know what I mean. There is actually the Buddha is the one we should uh, uh, bow down to and respect. And not so much the Bodhisattva, but not quite yet anyway. Huh? And so this is um, uh, the Buddha before his awakening. Yeah? He was an ordinary human being. Yeah? You can recognize some of the problems that he went through, just like anyone else. Uh, and then... After the Buddha's awakening, he was still a human being. One of the kind of really nice suttas that show you uh, the Buddha's humanity is where, this is the Samanyapala Sutta. I like to tell you the discourses, so if you want to look it up, you can check it out for yourself, right? Samanyapala Sutta, the fruits of the ascetic life. Long discourses number two, yeah. This, in this particular sutta, the king Ajatasattu, the king of Magadha, a very, very powerful king who goes to war with all the countries around him and gains a large territory. He was like the, the, one of the first people who started the Magadhan Empire that later became the emperor, uh, empire of King Ashoka, yeah. It started in many ways with him. And uh, he uh, is feeling a lot of remorse because he killed his father. His father, King Bimbisara, was a very righteous and good king. And because of ambition, he killed his father. Ambition, right? Ambition. People want to be ambitious all the time. Yeah, I, I want to be an ambitious young person to make my way in the world. But sometimes ambition can really, really lead you astray. Like in the case of King Ajatasattu. You're ending up killing your father because you are ambitious. So if you have to, are too ambitious, and ambition is always going to bias your mind in a certain way, bias it towards achieving your goals, chances are you will take shortcuts occasionally. So be very careful with ambition. Be ambitious on the spiritual path, and the other things, let them happen if they will. Yeah, that's, to my mind, the right approach on these kind of things. So anyway, he very ambitious and having a lot of remorse because he killed his father, a remorse that could never really be uh, let go of because this is one of those really bad crimes to kill your parents. Uh, and so he goes to see the Buddha. And the Buddha is in the Jivaka Ambavana, the Jivaka's mango grove, yeah, one of the famous sites in the Rajagaha. And if you go there, yeah, you can go there. Yeah, I'm, I'm going there soon. If you want to come with me, come with me. I'll take you to Jivaka Ambavana. I'll show you where it is. It's a, <laughs> it's a nice place in the Rajagaha. 
And uh, so he was sitting there, the Buddha and 1,250 monks, a large, large gathering of monks. And then King Adat Asatu arrived, and he's feeling nervous, yeah, he's feeling a bit shaky. And uh, he comes there and he looks out and he, his mind settles a little bit uh, and he looks out at all the monks and he asks Jivaka. Jivaka is his physician, Jivaka is his doctor. Uh, and so he asks Jivaka, which one is the Buddha? So the Buddha doesn't really stand out, right? Uh, the Buddha is a monk, he looks like a monk and he has a shaven head, he probably has robes like they had robes in those days. Uh, and you can't really tell who the Buddha is. Uh, does he have the 32 marks of a great man? Probably not, otherwise you'd be able to tell who he was. Is he three times the size of ordinary people? No, he's not. He's an ordinary person. So some of these myths that we sometimes hear about, they are a bit uh, dodgy. Yeah? So watch out for those dodgy myths and legends that we hear sometimes. So the Buddha was ordinary. He was a person like everyone else. He didn't really stand out from the crowd yeah? all that much. So this is one example of that. Another example, which is really a bit embarrassing for modern monks, uh, yeah? you see the Buddha arriving in a certain monastery, uh, and when the Buddha arrives in the monastery, they would set out a, uh, a, a, a what is that? They set out some water for him, yeah? and they would set out a little stool uh, and uh, prepare a seat, and uh, then the Buddha would wash his own feet. That is really embarrassing for modern monks, because sometimes modern monks, you get your feet washed by other people, but the Buddha would wash his own feet. It's like, oh no, <laughs> are we doing this right? Yeah, this is kind of, it's kind of almost scary in a sense. But that shows you also that the Buddha was kind of an ordinary person again. Yeah, he sits down, he washes his own feet. There's no sense that he is really, really extraordinary or out of the ordinary. He was one of the, one of the Sangha members in a certain way. And there are a large number of instances like this in the suttas where you see the Buddha acting in fairly normal ways. Uh, there's a place where the Buddha is walking around the huts of the monks, yeah? and when he walks around the huts, he's a bit like, a bit like Ajahn Brahm sometimes does, walking around and he sees a monk, and when the monk is doing well, he says, good on you. No, he doesn't say good on you, that's no straight expression, but he says something like that, the Indian, the Pali equivalent of good on you, whatever that might be. Yeah? And, uh, then, you know, one monk is sewing his robe, patching his robe, yeah? And uh, because he's patching his robe, the Buddha says, well done. That is what you should do, you should be patching your robes. And I, I'm going to prove to you that I'm trying to live up to the... Uh, the see this here? This is a patch. I'm trying to live up to the Buddha's... Uh, <laughs> I'm just bragging a little bit yeah, to show my patch. I'm actually proud of my patches. I think that's really a really positive thing here. Yeah. Um, so uh, the Buddha praises the monks for doing this, uh, yeah, and this is kind of really, really nice. Uh, and uh, other times the Buddha, very famous story of the Buddha that you may have heard before, uh, which is very beautiful, and it shows the humanity of the Buddha and the compassion of the Buddha, how he interacts with the Sangha. And this is where the Buddha, again, is walking around the monastery, uh, and when he's walking around the monastery, he comes to the hut of a certain monk, yeah? and in that monk, in that hut, uh, there is a monk who is really sick. Yeah? And he has dysentery. And dysentery is this really filthy illness where everything kind of comes out of your body. You get really stinky and filthy and bad. Everything kind of just comes out. And so the Buddha goes up to his monk and he sees that he is in a really terrible state. And he asks him, you are really sick. Why isn't anyone here to nurse you? Yeah, shouldn't someone be here to nurse you? And he says, no, no one is here to nurse me. And the reason is because I don't do anything for the other monks, so they don't do anything for me. What do you think? Yeah. Bad idea, right? Uh, what, what, what is going on here? <laughs> That's not the right way of thinking. Yeah. And so the Buddha, what the Buddha does, then is it, this is kind of remarkable. Yeah, you would think maybe the Buddha would go to the monks and say, okay, monks, please go and nurse this monk. No, that is not what the Buddha does. The Buddha says to Venerable Ananda, Ananda, go and fetch some water. Yeah. Ananda gets some water, and then the two of them, the Buddha and Ananda together, they clean up that monk, yeah? wash him down, put on some fresh robes, and then they take him by the head and the feet, and they put him on the bed. This is the Buddha yeah, acting. Yeah? And when you see that, it's almost difficult to imagine, because the way we are used to seeing the Buddha is like this. This doesn't look like someone who is going to, you know, wash anyone, right? This looks like someone who's always cool and chilled out and sitting in samadhi. 
But that is not the case. The Buddha has all of these other things to him. He actually interacts like a real human being, but of course, at the same time, with enormous compassion and kindness. This is what the Buddha is. And then, after having done this, after having cleaned up this monk, put him on the bed, then he goes to the monks and he says, Monks, why aren't you looking after the sick monk? And they say, well, he doesn't do anything for us, so we couldn't be bothered to do anything for him. And the Buddha is not impressed. <laughs> you can imagine, right? And the Buddha says to them, you have no mother and father. If you don't look after each other, who is going to look after you? And then he says, anyone who would look after me, in other words, look after the Buddha, should look after each other. This is a beautiful example, right? It's one in many ways, very touching, because it shows the humanity of the Buddha in a very, very powerful way. Yeah, the ordinary interaction with ordinary people. So these are some of the very inspiring things. Then there are some of the less inspiring things. Do you want to hear those? Are you sure? Yeah, because uh, I'm now quoting from the Vinaya. This, this, this is not the Vinaya. This is actually it's, it's both in the Vinaya and the Suttas. If you read the Vinaya, if you really want to get kind of disenchanted and see the dark side of humanity, go to the Vinaya. <laughs> These are all the stories about what people do wrong and how the Buddha has to lay down rules and these kind of things. And sometimes that can be useful because sometimes we think that everything at the time of the Buddha was just great. They were all arahants, they were all reborn because they had incredibly good karma. And today we have no chance to reach the same level. To disabuse you of that opinion, go to the Vinaya Pitaka. Straight away you realize, even at the time of the Buddha, there were all kinds of human beings, good ones, bad ones, exactly as it is in the present day. Yeah. But um, anyway, so some of these stories are not so inspiring, yeah? And uh, one of these stories is a monk called Badali, and you can read about Badali in the Majjhimanika 65 and the Badali Sutta. And there is this monk, and he uh, goes, has a chat with the Buddha, and the Buddha says, well, you know, you should follow the tradition of having one meal a day, or at least not eat after midday. Yeah? Then he refuses it. He refuses to the Buddha's face. Yeah, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to eat in the evening. Yeah. Yeah, can you, it's hard to imagine. If you met the Buddha, would you just refuse? No, no, I'm not going to follow what you say. You know, forget it. So, would, you, <laughs> would you do that? And the point is that this shows you that our perception of the Buddha is very different from their perception of the Buddha. To us, the Buddha is so grand, so immeasurable, so enormous, that it's hard to imagine ever saying no, ever arguing, ever disagreeing with the Buddha, yeah, because we have put him on this incredible pedestal. Huh? But in those days, the Buddha was more, kind of, he was one of the monks, yeah? They didn't see him quite that way. They saw him as a human being. And just like I might sometimes be disrespectful to Ajahn Brahm, huh? Don't ask Ajahn Brahm for the stories about me being disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very embarrassing for me. <laughs> but just in the same way as that happens in the present day, it also happened at that time, because the Buddha was, after all, human in this way. This is one such story, an even worse story. Yeah? This is the story which kind of, it just, sometimes you have to look for these things to really see them properly. Yeah? Sometimes you just kind of go past it, you go straight to the inspiring Dhamma, you don't see the ordinary things. Yeah? But this particular story is known as the incident in Kosambi, because it happened in Kosambi. And in Kosambi, uh, you had um, uh, the monks were arguing with each other. Yeah? And of course, the reason why they were arguing was something extremely trivial. Usually we argue about trivial things. Is that true in Malaysia as well? It's, it's certainly true in Australia. <laughs> usually it's just the humanity is like this. Yeah? This is the way we are usually. We can kind of build up until the tension becomes so big, the tiny little straw, yeah? the kind of trivial thing makes everything break, go down or, you know, or, or um, collapse in a certain way. Yeah? So the monks were arguing. Yeah? And then as the monks were arguing, a monk went to the Buddha. And they said to the Buddha, Venerable Sir, would you please come and help out out of compassion? Yeah, if you want to invite someone, and kind of a monk who is really important, Ajahn Brahm comes here, if you want to invite him to something, please ask, will you please come out of compassion? Uh, this is the traditional and the appropriate way of doing it. Because people who are uh, well-practiced, uh, they do things usually out of compassion and kindness. Uh, 
And uh, so, they, and then the Buddha goes, yeah, and he goes and he goes to all of those monks and he says, monks, enough, stop arguing, stop quarreling, yeah. And then a monk goes to the Buddha, yeah, or replies to the Buddha. And you know what he says to the Buddha? He says to the Buddha, please, the Venerable Sir, don't worry about us. You just go and relax, yeah, and go and have a good time and meditate, yeah. We will look after this. Yeah? <laughs> Isn't that kind of extraordinary? This is the leader of the whole Sangha. This is someone who started the religion of Buddhism. And then this monk just tells the Buddha basically, you know, just go away. Yeah, we, will, we will look after this. And the Buddha asks a second time. The monk says the same thing. The Buddha asks a third time. The monk says, says the same thing. And what does the Buddha do then? He walks away. He goes off. And that is where he goes off to the famous story of the Paralayaka forest, yeah, where the elephant looks after him and the monkey brings the kind of the, uh, well, that's actually a slightly different story, but the elephant looks after him or whatever. So the Buddha understands the limits even of his persuasive powers. He can only do so much. And if the Sangha doesn't listen, then maybe one of the most powerful ways of persuading people is to actually leave. And then maybe people come to their senses. And that, of course, is exactly what happened in this particular case. And so in all of these cases, what we are seeing, we're seeing the limits of the Buddha. We're seeing that the Buddha too had, he was a human being who had to live among humanity. And even though his mind was fully purified, even though he had the deepest insight into the nature of reality, he still was human in a very real sense and had to deal with ordinary human experiences. And so what would that Buddha, the human Buddha, yeah, the ordinary Buddha, the Buddha who deals in human society, what would that Buddha say if you ask him, how are you? <laughs> Good question, right? Um, and I think what he would say, precisely because he is an ordinary human being, precisely because he has to function in our human society, he probably would say, good, yeah, or something like that, yeah? Why? Because he has to function like everyone else. He doesn't want to make a scene out of everything. He doesn't want to prove that he is some kind of super-duper insight. Sometimes it goes along with the human conventions. And the human convention is to say sometimes, okay, good, I'm all right, yeah, no problems. I've had enough to eat or whatever it is. And so this is the two sides of the Buddha. And basically what I want to kind of get to is the idea that the Buddha would probably be flexible. And he would look at the occasion, and depending on the occasion, he might say, I'm fine. Another occasion, he might say something profound, depending on who is there, who is in the audience, and what the situation is like. And so I think this is maybe the thing that we should all learn from the Buddha, is to be a little bit flexible. Yeah? Flexibility, depending on the occasion. So sometimes you can say good. At other times you can say terrible. <laughs> I usually like to say terrible. If someone asks me how I said terrible, yeah, and they say why, and I say, well, Buddha said everything is dukkha, so it must be terrible. <laughs> just, I, I just like to say something different because everyone says good, right? After a while, it gets boring. Yeah, good, good, good. And so I like to say sometimes I like to say terrible, and it's more uh, makes, makes it more interesting. Yeah, but um, uh, so we can be a bit flexible in how we answer this question there, but still. What is the real answer to this? And this is what I've been kind of trying to get to all of this time. Yeah? So I've been kind of going this detour about the Buddha a little bit because it's fun to reflect on the Buddha and who the Buddha is. So we can make the Buddha more into a proper teacher for us. So what is the real answer? And the real answer from a Buddhist point of view, yeah, how are we? Well, first of all, it is impossible to really say how you are because compared to what? Compared to yesterday, last year, compared to enlightenment, compared to what? What does good mean? Of, often doesn't mean anything at all. It just means this kind of empty thing. It may be good for you, but the person next to you, the same goodness might be bad, yeah? Because we are different. And so what we have to do to give a proper answer to this question is come back to the purpose of the Dhamma, the purpose of the spiritual life. And the Buddha says that the purpose of the spiritual life is always to grow is to grow, is to get closer to the goal, to become more mindful, to become more kind, to become more compassionate in the world. This is the purpose of the spiritual path. And so what 
we should do, what this whole life is about. And this you can find this in many, many suttas, actually. What the Buddha says, you should do, you should make choices that will make you grow in the Dhamma. And if you stop growing in the Dhamma, you need to reconsider what you're doing. That is what the spiritual life is about. And so ideally, the answer you should give is that I'm getting happier. I'm getting more kind. I'm getting more compassionate. I'm growing in spiritual qualities. How are you? I am growing. That is really the right answer. Because then you are on the right track. Then you have understood that you are following the teaching of the Buddha in the right way. And you are growing. And if you keep on growing, there's only one end point to that keeping growing. And that end point is arahanship, awakening itself. That is where the whole thing ends. So that is uh, what I would recommend. Yeah? If you can honestly say that you are growing, then you are on the spiritual path. And if you're not growing, you should always ask yourself the question, why? This is the purpose of the Dhamma. The purpose is that we go somewhere to change who we are as human beings. And if you're not fulfilling that purpose, ask yourself with earnestness, yeah, with honesty, what is maybe going wrong in my spiritual path? What do I need to change? And then, if you do ask those difficult questions of yourself, then the growth is very likely to come back again. Then you're going to be on the right track. Then you too are going to be heading for awakening itself. So, there you are. Good luck with the path there. <laughs> sadu, sadu, sadu. Well, I, I forgot about the coffee. That must be, I got very excited about the talk. So. <laughs>